welcome to our CTSS most popular cases part five. So I have 10 cases that were looked at the most. So they were the most popular cases. And let me just look at them and see what's interesting about them. Case one, this was a cholangiocarcinoma. carcinoma. You'll notice on the non-contrast scans, there's not a whole lot to see and there's no evidence of cirrhosis of the liver. On the arterial mapping and then on the right on the late venous, you can see about a seven centimeter mass in the right lobe of the liver. It's mildly vascular, but not hypervascular. It doesn't change much between arterial and delayed or venous phase imaging, though it does seem to have a slightly enhancing rim on the image on the right. So you say to yourself, what could this be? It could be a hepatoma, possibly, but there's no cirrhosis. Still could be hepatoma. Could be a cholangiocarcinoma that often I like to see dilated ducts. Of course, it could be metastatic. When I look at the lesion, other things, focal nodular hyperplasia, hepatic adenoma, it's really not the enhancement pattern. There's some neovascularity seen on the MIP imaging. You can see on the arterial phase, it's somewhat infiltrating in nature, but again, a fairly well-defined mass. When you look a little bit later toward the uh, venous, you see that it extends toward the portal vein, but the main portal vein and SMV are patent. So really, when you think about it, with cholangios, we like to see dilated ducts, but don't need to. Sometimes you can see capsular retraction, but you don't need to. So to me, primary tumor, hepatoma versus cholangio, I guess the lack of cirrhosis might push me a little bit toward a cholangio, and this indeed was a cholangio carcinoma. Case two, patient... Uh, when you look, has a model density in the liver with multiple air bubbles. And if you look really, really hard, uh, yes, it could be an abscess, but it, it looks more like necrotic, which again, could be an abscess, but it's really extensive. Now you can have abscesses that are extensive. This would not be the look of an amoebic abscess, which is right low, but cystic. It's not the look of hydatid liver disease, which 80 plus percent will have calcification. I would think here, could this patient have had a process like diverticulitis or appendicitis and got secondary abscess? Could this be a patient who had recent surgery? I always like surgery as a possibility because when you see hepatic infarcts, particularly patients who've had surgery that involves the liver's vascular supply, I'm always thinking of a patient who had a Whipple's procedure. One of the complications is a hepatic infarct. And here you can see there's additional lesions in the liver besides the uh, area of infarction. So this was a patient with metastatic disease. This patient had had surgery, and this is hepatic necrosis with a large hepatic infarct. A really good case. Okay, case three. This is just a nice example showing you why gated acquisitions are really good for looking at the aortic root and aortic valve. When you're looking for dissection, gated acquisition is really good to help you overcall a dissection when it's simply motion artifact. And with gated acquisitions, you can see the aortic valve. If you take the coronal view and you put a line right through the aortic root, you can look at the aortic valve. And so you can see here the a closed and open look of a bicuspid aortic valve. There's some faint calcification consistent with aortic stenosis. Remember, patients with bicuspid aortic valves will get aortic stenosis at an earlier age. Here you can see on the coronal view the aortic root and the ascending aorta are both slightly dilated. But again, it's really that oblique image right through the root, looking down at the valve that very nicely shows you the bicuspid valve with minimal thickening. And I showed you the examples of the valve opening and closing. So a very nice example, okay? A really good example right here where you can see the two cusps of the bicuspid aortic valve. Okay, case four. This is a patient where it looks kind of funny on the image on your right. It looks like something's coming off the left ventricle. When you look at the axials, you can see there's some low density here, but the key is this calcification. 
And this is calcification in the wall of the left ventricle in a patient who had a prior infarct. You can kind of see that outpouching and the low density. Infarcts are typically low density on CT in the wall of the left ventricle and calcification over time, as shown in this case, is very nicely shown. Okay, case five. This was a hepatoma, cirrhotic liver, ascites, lots of nodularity. Just to show you some images here, which show the neovascularity within the lesion and the collateral flow in the patient's abdomen because of the patient's cirrhosis with portal hypertension. Portal vein appears to be involved centrally in the hilum of the liver. Patients with cirrhosis with hepatoma often will have portal vein involvement as shown nicely in this case. A really nice example. You can have other vascular liver lesions like an angiosarcoma perhaps, or vascular metastasis from renal cell carcinoma that can look very aggressive. But when I see cirrhosis and I see a mass, I gotta be thinking hepatoma. Okay, case six. Here's another of air fluid level in the liver. There are perfusion changes around it. This is most consistent with the liver abscess. Liver abscess can be a sequela of surgery, uh, anything from appendicitis to diverticular disease to uh, Whipple's procedure, colon surgery. Of course, liver abscesses can be a sequela of infection in the liver, primary there. It also can be secondary to inflammatory processes, and you have seeding. Again, think about appendicitis and diverticulitis. It could be due to endocarditis. Just a very nice example of uh, liver abscesses with fluid tracking down perihepatic. Just a really, really nice example, and a few nice images, including some 3D mapping. And here it is. You can see the, uh, the vessels being stretched by that abscess. There's no evidence of aneurysm or pseudoaneurysm in this case. Okay, case seven. Here's a very nice example. You see the aortic root with rim-like calcification and then an outpouching anteriorly off the aortic root. This can be the sequela of a dissection. It can be the sequela of a patient who's had repair of the aortic root, a very classic pseudoaneurysm. You can see the large pseudoaneurysm with partially uh, seeing some enhancement. You can see it here again on the coronal views, particularly nicely seen on the sagittal views, that outpouching, a very good example of a pseudoaneurysm. And again, we can see these at trocar sites. We can th see these at sites of surgery. And again, patients who've had ascending aorta repair, um, a valve repair, it's not gonna be uncommon as a complication. Again, you need to be aware of this. Uh, these obviously are concerning for the possibility that they can rupture, they can bleed, and so the patients will likely get surgery. Here it is very nicely shown on the cinematic and volume rendering. Real nice example of that outpouching or pseudoaneurysm through a range of projections. Okay, case number eight. Here's the liver, non contrast looks pretty good. On the arterial phase, you see a vascular lesion about five centimeters. You'll notice there's a central scar in the lesion. You'll also notice the lesion is vascular, but not as vascular as the aorta. It's only vascular as the IVC. When I see a mass that's vascular like the IVC, I'm always thinking about focal nodular hyperplasia. Hepatomas tend to be more vascular, looking more like the aorta, and the same is true typically with hepatic adenomas. Metastasis can be a range of appearances, and theoretically, a metformelanoma can look like this. Then, of course, we're going to look at the washout value. One of the things you saw in the last image was a central scar that's more common in focal nodular hyperplasia than, say, metastasis. And then these lesions wash out. So when you go out at about 60 to 80 seconds, the lesion is almost totally gone. You can make out a little bit of its outline, right? But it's nearly isodense. And that's going to be the appearance of focal nodular hyperplasia. Remember, anything can become isodense over time, or almost anything. But FNH has that classic hypervascular, like the IVC, maybe a central scar. 
If you do MIP imaging, you can often see a feeding vessel that goes to the central scar, and then fairly quickly the lesion becomes isodense and nearly is non-visible. Okay, case nine. Here's a cystic lesion, which looks like the gallbladder, till you recognize on these other images that you have a gallbladder there, and this is a cystic lesion. It's coming off or rising from the liver. There's some very thin septations, and you can see it here as well, the septations better. So when I ask what's a cystic lesion that's coming off the liver, but arising from the liver that's not the gallbladder and has septations, it's not gonna be a simple hepatic cyst. Though it looks very cystic, hepatic cysts typically don't have septations. It's not gonna be a met. You can get cystic metastasis like from just tumors or ovarian cancer, but they're not as homogeneous and not as smooth. When you see a cystic lesion like this, you gotta think about biliary cyst adenoma. In the old days, it would always be arguing biliary cyst adenoma versus cyst adenocarcinoma. Cyst adenocarcinoma typically had nodules or thicker septations, but these days it's felt that biliary cyst adenomas are a precursor to cyst adenocarcinoma. So once you see it, it's going to be resected. And again, the septations, uh, you can see septations in Idata disease, but then 80% of the time, multiple lesions, and they're calcified. So this is most consistent with a biliary cystadenoma. Again, very nice septations. You put this in the pancreas, I would have said a mucinous cystic neoplasm. Okay, case number 10, which is our last case for today. This patient has a large hemoperitoneum, and you could see that anteriorly left lobe of liver, there's an active bleed present. The first question I would have asked in this patient with end-stage renal disease, did the patient have a recent biopsy? Did the patient have trauma? Now, renal osteodystrophy, you can see the bones, the end-stage renal disease. In a sense, end-stage renal disease is not a cause of hepatic bleeding. You can see there's a transplant kidney that seems to be functioning well in the right lower quadrant. So when I see a spontaneous bleed with active bleeding, I always ask the question, did the patient have a recent biopsy? Did the patient have recent trauma? And if the answer to both of those is no, I look carefully at the liver, which I always do anyway. I look for a tumor. Tumors that can bleed include hepatoma, hemangioma theoretically, Hepatic adenoma is always at the top of our list. I don't see a mass here, but I do see the act of bleeding tracking around the right lobe of the liver. I can see the renal osteodystrophy in this patient with end-stage renal disease and now a renal transplant. But the question is, what caused the hepatic bleed? Uh, the patient did have trauma and that was likely the cause of the patient's spontaneous hepatic bleed. This patient did okay long-term. Again, just some nice examples showing you the spine. And with that, I've showed you 10 cases. Let us know what cases you like. The way we know is the more people who look at them, the higher the number. That's the reason. And with that, I wish everybody a great day. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.